A very good evening, warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, our live tastings, which continue tonight with two seriously cool winemakers who we'll be catching up with in just a moment. I think there's still a fair amount of delight flowing through South Africa with wine sales being open, purchases being available, people happily stocking up. I've been down to my local pick and pay a couple of times and seen very happy shoppers in the aisles. And what's been quite interesting is that not dissimilarly to the stage after the first prohibition, as opposed to the second and hopefully last prohibition, a lot of the wine that I saw purchased was wine that was sort of middle to higher end. People are investing a, a maybe just a, a touch more in their wine purchases and they're rewarding themselves for the time they've had off, albeit time off not of their own volition. It's an interesting evening ahead. We have, as I say, two great wine people coming up in just a moment, but also later on this evening, so pencil this in at about 8.30, I will be hanging out with that seriously deranged chef, David Higgs. God only knows what he'll be wearing this evening. And we'll be looking back at our highs, both food and wine-wise, over the period of lockdown. I've had some terrific wine, met some wonderful people over the course of Dan Really Likes Wine in Lockdown. Also had the chance to make some great meals with some fantastic chefs through the Kitchen Closed series in tandem with Brightrock. Uh, we'll also see what food and wine David has been particularly enjoying. And geez, had enough of it. His Instagram in particular has been a force of nature over the last little while. Now, also a force of nature is one of the great figures of modern South African wine. Uh, he's actually really an apple farmer masquerading as somebody in the wine industry, and he's got a major role in international television. We'll discuss that a little later with Paul Kluver, Paul Kluver himself, who comes to us from his 26-bedroom estate on the outskirts of Elgin, and we'll talk Riesling, and we will talk Pinot Noir, and excitedly so with both. But first up, we've got somebody who's uh, one of the younger guns in the winemaking world, but someone whose star has risen and risen and risen to the point where two questions arise. Uh, where on earth is he going next? And why on earth is he selling his wine quite so inexpensively? Because gee, it is fabulous stuff and the value is astonishing. Long may it stay that way for us, the consumers, but I suspect that even the generous Mr. Lumprecht might be pushing those prices up sooner or later because his wine certainly does deserve to be bracketed a little higher up. So let's say hello to the man behind that terrific wine. Uh, Martin Lumprecht to the world, Maris to his mates. Either way, a very, very good evening and a can in hand. How are you, Maris? Good evening, Dan. Uh, thanks for having me. I, I tried to set up my studio to give you a kind of talks and chops uh, kind of vibe here. Yeah? So, uh, no, all good. Raining outside in the Swartland. Uh, uh, we're able to sell booze legally again, um, and uh, yeah, life's good. I, I note the important distinction, we're able to sell booze legally again as just selling it, so we, we won't ask for the reason for that distinction. Uh, good, to, good to see you. Welcome on. It's, it's lovely to have you on the show, somebody whose wine I've enjoyed for a, 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 some time now since Gavin Dittmar first dropped some off for Meridian and told me I should try it, and I've been lapping it up ever since. Before we get into the wine, though, you are a farmer, a tart, you're making wine, uh, uh, you're in the Swartland, rain now. Uh, how important is that rain? What are, what are weather conditions like at the moment? How are things looking for the 2021 crop? Yeah, I think uh, the the positive thing about the rain now is more for 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 the uh, canola and uh, wheat farmers. Uh, we've had obviously some exceptional rain, and the dams are full. But the rain now is really for the dryland uh, canola and and wheat farmers. Um, it's quite cold. There is some snow on the mountains, which is always a good sign. And um, in Afrikaans, we say we talk about the Bosfeld TV. So, as you can see, I've I've, I've started my Bosfeld TV, and uh, we haven't. I'm not a guy that watches too much television. Um, I normally only watch television for live sport, and uh, lately, um, watching live sport without uh, without the the crowds attending, it's uh, almost like drinking coke without brandy. Um, it's uh, lacks a bit of energy. So. Uh, we've got uh, a lot more Bosfeld television uh, that we're watching uh, lately. 
<laughs> That's a wonderful Swartland analogy, like drinking Coke without the brandy. Uh, life has changed, be it sport, be it what we drink, be it uh, how the world operates as a whole. Uh, what have the last five months been like for you uh, from a wine perspective? Obviously, sales down and very difficult, but has it allowed you a bit of creative time, a little bit of time for reflection on uh, where the Maras brand is and, and where it might be headed? Yeah, well, um, obviously, uh, picked up on loads of bad habits. So uh, I'm that kind of guy that picks up a bad habit quite easily. And uh, being forced not to travel or work for some time, uh, yeah, bad habits have been be becoming part of my life. Um, so it's going to take some time to get rid of those. And uh, wine-wise, uh, you know, men are terrible at uh, at at, uh, at doing administration. So at least I had like uh, six or eight months of administration to catch up on. Um, so that was more or less uh, my life uh, during lockdown, catching up on some, some administration. Uh, yeah. It, it doesn't sound wildly exciting, uh, so I'm sure you're, you're very glad that things have changed a little and we're able to get back to the important business of drinking wine, which is what we're going to be doing with you. Before we crack open the first, not bottle, but can, uh, one last question for you in terms of the, the Martin Lamprecht story, because it seems to me, from, from what I've read from people I've spoken to, uh, that sort of David Nevo took you under his wing uh, and a week later discovered that you could make better wine than he could. And uh, it was just this marvellous story of uh, uh, becoming this great winemaker almost overnight. Yeah, I mean, my philosophy is a bit different. Uh, I don't believe that there's something like, uh, like, a, like a good or a great winemaker. Um, there's so many other elements that... Uh, forms part of having wine in a bottle uh, and and the human part or the winemaking part for me forms a very small part of that but uh, no I mean I was fortunate enough uh, to have my first job with David Nivot uh, which is a great character a champion of a winemaker um, and I think it's important uh, because obviously there's an image when it comes to winemaking uh, and maybe a bit of a skewed image to uh, what what it's all about. So sometimes it always looks uh, flashy and dashy and um, there's a lot of hard work that, that needs to go into that and a lot of dirty work as well. Um, so David is that kind of guy, I mean, making a, a success of a, a winery up in the Cedarburg um, that just tells stories about the man's, uh, the man's uh, ability to, to, to work hard and, and to drive. Um, wine making um to that extent so no i mean it was important for me um to get into the right track and david nivert is uh the best track to be in um obviously he's been through it he started off a business um he's made the mistakes um and i could easily learn from that uh, and avoid making those same mistakes um so no i mean hats off to him there's clearly a lot of respect for him. It is certainly mutual. He holds you in very highly re high regard and speaks very highly of you. And he speaks very highly of your wine. So let's get into the wine and kick off the first of the three that we have to taste with you. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it is not a bottle, but it is a can. Now, you might be thinking, Dan, you heathen, how can you possibly be drinking wine out of a can? That's barely better than wine out of a box. This is dreadful. I'm never, ever watching Dan really likes wine again. Uh, but then you could do a little bit of research and do some Googling and discover that around the world, and America in particular, the canned wine market has absolutely taken off. And not because it's just quirky or just different or just interesting. Uh, there are a lot of great reasons to put wine in a can. I can probably name a few of them, but uh, I'll let you as the man who's done it, Maris, tell me what your motivation was. Uh, what made you wake up one morning, uh, have your, uh, your brandy and Coke for breakfast and think, this might be a good idea. Yeah, I mean, um, I've got a lot of lockdown stories, uh, a lot, which probably it's too early to tell. But um, I mean, obviously, cans um, has got <laughs> a huge environmental uh, aspect to it. Uh, and I've got a story around that. Uh, my cans of Maras actually saved the life of a springbok 
uh, this year, and I'm not talking about a rugby player, I'm talking about uh, the antelope. So, obviously, being in ban or alcohol ban, um, there was not much to do. So, we, we took on a, a hunting trip, and obviously, uh, I was never going to go on a hunting trip without uh, putting or getting some wine or transporting some wine. So, obviously, having a can, which is quite small, is quite convenient. They fit all all around in, in your vehicle. I mean, in the fuse box, in the, in the spare wheel cabinet, they just fit in everywhere. So um, that was quite convenient to, to fit in a lot of wine in my vehicle um, on my way to this hunting trip. And uh, so it was springbok hunting in the Karoo. And um, I don't know if you've been on these hunting trips, but uh, they kind of put you in different locations um, and the morning you kind of just pack your bag because you don't really know how long you're going to be out in the felt. So there's always a, a roll of toilet paper in your bag, a packet of nuts, um, a paki biltong, and, and then I obviously threw in a few of these cans. And then obviously the first like 40 minutes when they drop you, you kind of get a bush and you get your location. And uh, then you quite, uh, you observe, quite seriously observing where, if you see any movement. And then like after 40 minutes, it becomes quite boring because you're hearing your mates shooting back up on on the other side and, and you're just noticing nothing. And uh, I let my guard down, I put my rifle down and it was quite windy. And I got myself a nice position up against the bush. Um, and opened up a can of maras and started eating like a springbok biltong and then the next moment i could just see on the corner of my eye like a springbok just creeping up on me and uh and i looked up and there was the springbok ram like really close to me just checking me out and i was sipping on my my maras can and and eating my biltong and my rifle was just too far away and i wasn't I was I, I didn't want to make too of a sudden movement to get to the rifle, um, but this buck was really close. I, I think if I got hold of my rifle, um, there wasn't enough space to get the rifle in between the two of us. Um, and I was sipping on the scan, and the scan finished, and this this Springbok ram was just looking at me. Um, and the only thing I could reach, I finished my can, and the only thing I could reach that time was was another Mara scan. Uh, and when I opened up the can, it makes that click sound. Uh, the springbok ram just dashed away. Um, so, uh, yeah, his life got saved by a can of wine. So it's obviously very environmental friendly. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how you're going to fit that entire story onto the back of a can, but if you if, if you do manage it, it'll be a great piece of marketing. Uh, it's also, of course, it's convenient. You can chill it. It's not plastic. Uh, it's an, uh, a nice, uh, nice friendly volume as well. A couple of basic questions around canned wine. Should I be drinking this out of the can or should I be pouring it into a glass? No, I think the whole thing is about convenience. So, uh, I, th I mean, having the experience going on a hunting trip, I think this is where, where glass becomes, I, I wouldn't say a dangerous uh, object, but... Um, this is where you would go on a hike or, or be on a boat or be on the beach where, where you really avoid loss. So I, I would think um, the essence is to, to drink it out of the can. Um, and I mean, at first, the, the, the really big mind shift you have to make here is that all the beverages we drink out of can is we kind of finish them quite quickly. Um, so like to, to finish three beers out of can is... Uh, that's an easy brainer for me and then after the three cans uh, i'm i haven't even started so but when it comes to cans it's a, it's a totally different ball game so i mean <laughs> when you finish three cans of wine um you finish the bottle of wine um uh, and that puts you in a in a very different situation <laughs> all right so we've got to be a little more measured in our consumption i've had my first mouthful it's not the first time i've had this you very kindly had some dropped off before lockdown. There's not too much of it left. And I think the, the two things that got me straight away were, one, 
there isn't any element of tin or of can, as there shouldn't be if you think about it, because when you have a, a Coke or an appetizer, you don't get a taste of tin or can. Um, and the second one was that uh, it was pretty much as I was drinking wine out of a bottle. I didn't feel there was any distinctive change in flavor. Sure, no, I mean... I'm very realistic when it comes to these things. Obviously, the only thing you can't do is swirl it around and get the aromas out of the glass. But, I mean, apart from that, um, I've, I, I'm doing the same wine in the can which goes into to the bottle. And, I mean, it, it's got length. It's got structure. It's got, it's got everything. Um, it just hasn't got that... Uh, that uh, connoisseur element of swirling it uh, and sniffing it. So apart from that, I, th I think uh, everything else uh, ticks the box. Um, um, so for me, it's convenient. It packs quite well. You can hide it away in, in dodgy times and uh, enjoy it anywhere without loss. I think I've got the name for your next can of wine, Smuggler's Delight by Martin Lamplet. Is, uh, is the way to go. Uh, the other thing I like about this one, this is a 2019, so it's got uh, it's got a year of can aging to it as opposed to bottle aging. Yeah, well, the company that uh, that does uh, the canning is Tiny Keg. So, um, I mean, obviously, it's uh, it's very early days, and the research uh, behind uh, canning is 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 very limited. So, at this stage. We say as a benchmark, uh, we keep it in no longer than 12 months. Um, so it's an evolving thing. It's something new. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've tasted the 2019 over a period of time. And, I, I mean, I'm not – I wouldn't uh, – I wouldn't uh, class myself as a very uh, a very fine taster, but uh, I couldn't really pick up anything between all the brandy and the bryflies. <laughs> oh dear, I love the honesty, Martin. Uh, as do uh, a number of our guests, Skulk Stapelberg, saying, love the wine, a regular in my cellar. Skulk, thank you. Good to have you along again. Uh, and Andrew Woolga, hide it away in dodgy times. Love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, giving us some great entertainment, also some great wine. Let's try a second of those, Martin, if we may. Uh, and this is your Cinso, uh, the uh, the 2018 the Trickster. Uh, as I pour it, uh, talk me through the name there. Why the Trickster? Yeah, the, the Trickster, uh, obviously the jackal um, is, is from my family crest, so... Having a jackal on your family crest, uh, obviously, there's probably more negatives than positives there. But um, one of the things is uh, that a jackal kind of, in folklore, the trickster is the guy that that kind of finds a way to do things differently and get away with that. So the trickster, since so, um, is picked early and it's unwooded, so. Uh, it's a bit unconventional or a bit upstream uh, with regards to what, what people are used to. Um, and, um, yeah, I think, I mean, no good story starts with I had a salad. So my philosophy always uh, has been uh, it, should, it should drink easy. Um, it, sh it, it should just be smashable. So that's just one of those wines uh, – which you can drink in summer, you can drink it in winter, you can chill it. Um, and obviously I've been quite surprised with that Trickster Senso uh, that uh, even though it's light, you would think that it doesn't match up with bigger things like beef. Um, but I, I mean, sometimes the balance between having a big piece of steak uh, and having a light red wine, that kind of complements. So I was quite surprised to see that uh, that wine is quite versatile when it comes to fruit uh, or, or food as well. Um, and I mean, since so has, has been around so long, um, it's obviously a difficult varietal to sell. I mean, I, I don't think I would have the, the bank manager knocking on my door so frequently if I've been selling uh, Cabernet Sauvignon or Sauvignon Blanc. So um, it's also a thing of uh, educating consumers because... I mean, there's so many people that really, when they drink red, it's Shiraz, Cabernet, Merlot. And when they drink white, it's Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. So 
a lot of these varietals, we don't we don't make wine from them because we want to be hip or we want to be uh, rock rock star vibe uh, winemakers. It's really uh, dryland farming. So these varietals really um, they really they survive in these really tough Swartland conditions where where water uh, is restricted. Um, they don't get any uh, irrigation. So the, really the, the grapes that they ripen is all from, from rainwater. Um, so that's that's why we work with these things. And it's obviously going to take probably a generation or two um, to change the perception of uh, red wine being Cabernet and Merlot and Shiraz uh, to that there are actually varietals uh, which are worthy and and resembles uh, the Swartland way better than those other varietals. It's uh, an entirely honest and, and accurate uh, perception. It's also uh, just another reminder of the enormous quotability of Martin Lamprecht. Two perlers there. No great story starts with a salad. And uh, I just think this wine is smashable. Uh, brilliant. I use these uh, next time I uh, I have a tasting. Uh, I see you're doing something there. Mike Ratcliffe's saying need to throw another log on the fire. He'd spotted it. Uh, okay. Skulk Stapelberg, one of those days in Cape Town where you burn up a lot of logs and drink plenty of red wine. So Mike and Skulk both getting stuck in there. Uh, and then Ina Smith, the grand overlord of Chenin Blanc. Uh, please say hi to Martin. I've not had the opportunity to meet up with him recently. Really need to set that right soon. Some important Chenin Blanc stories to come. Uh, the Cinto is great. And I think uh, as much as you, you make a fair point on the Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Shiraz, trifecta leading the red wine challenge i i do feel that since is starting to make more of an impact and it's since like this that certainly helps that cause there's also uh, another red wine that's trying to fight its way to the top that would be grenache that's the the third of the wines we have uh this one you're picking is clough uh grenache uh tell us a little about this particular wine mr maras uh yeah I think this vineyard, um, it's an exceptional vineyard. And I think for the people that haven't seen, it's always so difficult to to um, describe a, a place. But I've done some really good effort to shoot a nice Maras video about all the sites where these wines or these vineyards grow. So if you go onto YouTube and you search for Maras wines, you'll find this video. Um, and it's just exceptional. I mean, when you're driving out of the Swartland and it's basically 200 meters above sea level and instantly you're about 800 meters above sea level. So um, obviously incredible view to the West Coast. So obviously in the evenings, evenings you've got this West Coast um, cool breeze coming onto the mountains. Um, so where we pick in the Swartland anything from 20 January, um, in Pikenischkloof, it kind of drags because obviously of this cooler conditions, the hanging time and the ripening time of the grapes um, is much longer. Um, and that's got obviously a few uh, a few uh, positives. I mean, more phenolic ripeness, loft, lovely soft uh, powdery tannins. Um, but the, really apart from that, it, it's also dryland farming up there. So no irrigation and... I mean, we've come out of like a four-year drought, three-year drought, and to be up there in the middle of harvest, uh, it's like 35 degrees Celsius. These vineyards haven't seen water for for very long. Um, it's quite humbling to see how they just stand up tall, um, how they take the weather, how they take the sun, uh, and almost proud themselves on that um, and still ripen grapes, which we can make uh, wine from. Uh, so that's quite a humbling experience. And I think that's where you kind of realize that that specific varietal really does belong where it's planted. Um, yeah, Grenache, it, it's, it's also one of those challenging things where uh, perceptions need to change. I mean, I've been to a lot of these wine uh, shows and people ask, do you have Merlot? And then I just pour some Grenache. Uh, and then it's the best uh, Merlot they've had uh, like forever um so it's it's all about the perception and uh it's gonna take some time unfortunately 
<laughs> Cheerful dishonesty. Look, it works for Dan really likes wine, so I'm glad it's working for the Maras brand as well. Uh, I've got one final question for you in a moment. I can see on my, our other camera, our second guest, Paul Kluver is busy doing crunches with his shirt off. Paul, if you just put the shirt back on before you come on camera, it would be much appreciated. That body hasn't seen a lot of sun of late, and it's not off a great starting point either. Uh, but before I ask you that final question, just quickly on Grenache. Uh, this is now three years old. Uh, is Grenache in general and Maras Grenache in particular a uh, wine that, that can age a bit, that we can hang on to? No, that, I mean, that was 2017, so that was... That was kind of when Mara started. So, to be quite honest, the vintage back then was quite all over the show. I had some fermenting in a bin and some fermenting in a bucket and some fermenting. Um, so, I mean, I always say that when, when a vineyard grows on the right spot and it bears the right yield of grapes uh, and the winemaking isn't uh, uh, cocked up too much, uh, there's no reason there's no reason why that wine shouldn't be aging um so even though my philosophy is that the, the wines the maras philosophy i don't make showstopper wines i make enjoyable wines um the philosophy is not to to buy three cases and put them in your cellar to celebrate when your child turns 21 in 25 years time um it's more about uh it's more about just capturing moments because, I mean, I think, and that's probably one of the COVID uh, positives was that, I mean, yeah, life changes so quickly for everybody and uh, we need to celebrate on the short term, we need to celebrate life more often. So um, that's kind of where Maras is at. And a, and, a, and a space where you clearly look comfortable and clearly look happy and are clearly delivering some wonderful assessments of both your wine and the world at large. Uh, just before we let you go and move over to the blonde bombshell from Elgin, a uh, two-part question to wrap up. Uh, Daryl Balfour saying Maras wines offer exceptional value. Love the Grenache. It's the one I'm drinking now, a little old. It is a great wine, Daryl. And Skulk Stapelberg wants to know, can we do a tasting on the farm? As you answer that question, also answer for me this, your wine is really good. Uh, it might not be wine that's made for three generations and to keep in the family cellar, but it's very good wine, Martin. And yet you sell it at anywhere between 60 and top end, maybe 85, 90 rand a bottle. This is very inexpensive wine. Uh, there's clearly a philosophy behind it. I'm interested to know why the price points are so low after you've let Skull know if he and his family of 17 can come and stay with you for a week no i mean uh we're busy uh renovating a space in the rubik valley uh which would serve as a, a tasting room and uh we'll have all kinds of fun stuff there beer and uh, everything else music on vinyl and stuff like that but uh so they're more than happy i'm always around so if uh yeah just give me a call uh at least like 24 hour notice uh, and I'll be able to make a plan. Um, what was the next question? Uh, it was about oh, the price. price the Martin. Yeah, so I think the philosophy behind that totally comes back to uh, the varietals that we sell. So I think the really great examples of, of, of Grenache and, and since so in, in our local market probably retails uh, uh, over 200 rand a bottle. Um, and so then you're really speaking to a very small crowd. So a very, I would say, um, niche uh, wine connoisseur crowd, which understands Sanson, which understands Grenache, uh, uh, and they're willing to take the risk to pay 250 or 300 rand for a bottle of Grenache or a bottle of Sanson um, uh, and drink it. And yeah, my philosophy is that if we're going to change perceptions, uh, I need to put the wine out there at a price where somebody is willing to take the risk. So uh, if you if you heard all the funky stuff about Grenache, you're hearing all the funky stuff about Sinso, but I mean, times are tough. Um, and uh, if I look at myself, I will be willing to take a risk at 80 bucks or 75 bucks uh, just to try it out. Um, so I trying really to create wines at that price point, uh, which is over delivers at that price, but it creates a perception where people realize that uh, 
varietals like Grenache and Cinso, which obviously in the short term, um, if I had to plant Cabernet Sauvignon, I would make a savvy Cabernet Sauvignon and I would make a savvy Merlot, but uh, I mean, we have to be multi-generational when we're looking at these things. So uh, to change the perception at a lower price point, um, the sustainability of these vineyards in the Swartland um, will just be immense. So probably not in my in my lifetime, but uh, in two or three uh, generations, people will understand Grenache and they will understand Sinso and we will be able to plant uh, shitloads of that and uh, people will be drinking that. So, um, yeah, I think that's the, the thought behind the price. Well, look, it's, it's a price point that as consumers we win from and we win magnificently. And I'm very happy uh, that you do that. And it's also great that South Africans are able to access particularly these uh, slightly less popular, less, less well-known uh, varietals uh, like a Grenache or a Cinto at those sort of prices and get such great quality. So, uh, Myros, I'm very happy that you do that. I think it's going to be a terrific legacy that you leave together with the, the rest of the Swatland. Uh, I'm also really looking forward to having you back on the show again soon because you're fabulously entertaining uh, and you give us some great lines. So uh, we'll definitely do that maybe with some of the, the newer vintages soon. Uh, Skalk Stapelberg would like to know uh, how you book a taste. Just send a fax to Maras. Uh, his fax number is on his website. Um, if you go to go to the Maras Wines website, you'll be able to find all the details there, Skalk. And uh, yeah, um, Maras, thank you so much for the time and uh, nurturing that fire behind you. Uh, good luck getting out of the bad habits and into the good ones uh, and uh, moving towards that 2021 vintage. Uh, and keep doing what you do so well, which is making really cool, really interesting, really accessible wines at great price points that people thoroughly enjoy, no matter what level of wine connoisseur they might be at. You do a terrific job. You can be very proud of it. And I'm very excited to see what comes next. Like, uh, I've got some lovely uh, lamb chops waiting. Uh, my father farms in the Karoo. So I've got some lovely uh, Karoo lamb chops going on. And I think I'll do that with a bit of Maras Grenache. Which, of course, he's only having to cook because you couldn't be bothered to shoot a springbok, Martin. But uh, that's a story for another time. OK, so there we go. Martin Lamprecht, the man behind the Maras range. Really inexpensive wine, really cool wine. As he said, it's not stuff to stick away in the cellar for the next 30 years. You're drinking it over the next few years. Uh, kind of like the, the Argentinians have their fruit bomb approach to the Malbecs that they want to get stuck into immediately. It's wine to drink now, to enjoy now. And it is a very important part of the wine world to have. I see uh, Helen Nickel, my dear mother, is watching a Grenache fan here. Uh, there actually isn't a wine that my mother doesn't drink, so saying she's a Grenache fan doesn't really amount to much, but she is one of those. She also loves Riesling and she loves Pinot Noir, which leads rather nicely into our second guest for Dan Really Likes Wine this week. And he's a man I have to apologize to because he was in an Instagram live session a couple of nights ago uh, with David Higgs, the elderly chef, and there were a number of comments that came on that were allegedly under my name, but which David Higgs was clearly typing up himself because I never would have said anything remotely nasty or rude to such a revered figure as our guest now. So with humble apologies, let me say a very good evening, Mr. Paul Kluver. How are you, Paul? And, and welcome to the show. Hi, Dan. Uh, yeah, uh, um, those comments were amazing. Thank you very much. Huh? <laughs> it was a royally, royally entertaining session you had with David the other day in celebration uh, of International Pinot Noir Day, and uh, as well as some terrific information and some lovely engagement. What it did for me was just provide entertainment, provide fun, provide enjoyment. And it, I know it's a big part of your philosophy on farming as a whole, but, but wine in particular, and something we sometimes lose in the self-importance of wine, that if we're going to make it accessible, if we're going to get more people to drink and engage in and celebrate wine, it has to be an enjoyable space. It has to be entertainment. It has to be something that people want to be part of. Without a doubt. Um, you know, we can... Um... I, I think sometimes the wine industry is its own worst enemy because we 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 like to take a glass of wine and swirl it around and say, "Don't you just love that bouquet?" And about ninety percent of people just have no clue what you're talking about. Where at the end of the day, all you want to know is, "Do you like it?" Um, and if you like the wine, you should drink it um, more than anything else. Is is encouraging people to to pick it up, enjoy it, and just have fun. 
And that's uh, the philosophy, really, of Dan really likes wine. Two types of wine. A good wine is when you like, a bad wine is when you don't. But what we try and do is get people to experiment a bit, a bit more, to discover a bit more, to step away from that standard bottle of Sauvignon Blanc they drink every single week and do a bit more exploring. We're going to do a bit of exploring in just a moment, uh, particularly with the Riesling. And Riesling is a varietal uh, that I'm really excited to drink with you because I think we do it better in South Africa, and you're a great example, uh, than we often give it credit for. But in an important question before we do that, and I've had uh, just since uh, yesterday when announcing formally that you were going to be on the show, Paul, I've had uh, between 35 and 40,000 emails, tweets, Facebook posts, faxes, TikToks, Instagrams. I had a letter pushed under my door. Is Paul Kluver really the guy from Fraser? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> It is an uncanny resemblance. Have you ever been stopped in the street by somebody telling you, gee, I love your show? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Disappointing me enormously. I was hoping. 15,000 emails on that. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we we did have a, a great deal of uh, of interest though, and a lot of people very excited that we're going to be chatting to you because you you've got a brand that has got a, a, a fiercely devoted following. There are a lot of loyal Kluver fans around the world. I've got a, a mate in Australia who swears by the Seven Flags Pinot Noir is the only wine he'd drink if it was the last bottle he could possibly have. Uh, but it's I think important to note that wine is just part of the Kluver empire, because in reality, you're actually an apple farmer masquerading as a wine person. Yeah. I mean, Elgin um, I mean, is the heartland of South Africa's apple industry. Um, I, I've, I've always said, um, if I want to know if we've made it in the wine industry, it would be that we must be the most known brand from Elgin. And I want to ask you, what do you think is the most well-known brand from Elgin? I would suggest probably Appletizer. You're right. Yeah, it's the it's the home of Appletizer. It's where Appletizer was discovered, made, and is still the the home factory. We actually supply Appletizer with a lot of apples, um, and and it's a house of a household brand within South Africa. Um, so yeah, I mean that's um, uh, the Elgin Valley. It's it's also ironically what makes it a great wine producing area. It was in the mid mid eighties when Marlborough, New Zealand, Oregon, United States became famous for cool climate wine, wine production. And the question was asked, where, where in South Africa can we, can we grow cool climate wines? Uh, and my father was actually the pioneer. He planted the first commercial vineyards um, in 1997. Um, we were the first wine seller to open up in the Elgin Valley. Um, and we haven't looked back since. It's been an incredible journey. And uh, I see Mike uh, Ratcliffe uh, mentioned some some well, uh, extra logs that has to go into the fire. But I mean, uh, uh, Mike, uh, we we shared the same distributor back when when I started in 1997, um, which uh, uh, was NMK Schultz. I don't know if you know that, remember them, but uh, um, uh, what an incredible journey. It's produced this this empire, and I don't say it frivolously because you've got the farm, you've got some of the greatest mountain biking on the planet. I spent a fair amount of time with the Cape Epic making our way through Paul Kluver. But for me, it's definitely the wine that sits top of the list, and it's wine that you make superbly. And I, I, love, uh, I love a lot of your wines. I've drunk a lot of the, the Seven Flags in particular. Uh, but the wine we have today is wine that I'm, I'm really interested to try because the, the first wine in particular is one that some Africans aren't that familiar with. It's not a, a grape we see too much of, and I don't think it's a grape that we understand as much as we could, myself included. Uh, and that is the Riesling. So maybe give us just generally a little bit of a, an introduction to Riesling and why this German white wine finds such a natural home uh, on the estate of a blonde, blue-eyed Aryan wine farmer. I mean, so the amazing thing is, is that uh, the, the, the history of Riesling in South Africa is quite uh, checkered in the sense that traditionally what we know as Riesling was actually not Riesling but Crucial Blanc. Uh, so uh, the, the, the first Rieslings imported into South Africa weren't the, the, the amazing 
Weisser Riesling or Rhine Riesling grape varietal. And it, uh, it was only later on, um, uh, and literally, I think it's, it's now been five or six years that we've been able to call Riesling Riesling in South Africa. Prior to that, it had to be Weisser Riesling or Rhine Riesling. Um, and the Christian Blanc variety doesn't have the same gravitas as, as Riesling. Uh, um, uh, and uh, sadly, because of that, there are very few great Riesling producers in South Africa. There's uh, about 20 in total. South Africa, when it comes to producing Riesling, is tiny in the world scale. I, I actually sit on the International Riesling Foundation board, which is based in America. And my first board meeting I attended, uh, the guys were like, welcome. It's amazing having you here. How many cases do you guys produce down there in South Africa? It was like 20,000 cases. And the guys looked at me and said, Paul, not you, South Africa. And I was like, yeah, 20,000 cases. Uh, and, I mean, that's the incredible thing. The largest Riesling producer in America produces over a million cases of Riesling. Uh, so you, it, it just puts it into scale how small we are in South Africa when it comes to Riesling production. We Five might be grow it. Oh, yeah, but hey. we might be small, but, uh, but I think we do make some terrific Riesling, and this I this agree. is an yeah. example of it. Uh, it's obviously led by the Germans, and I was I was pushed back into Riesling, having not had some in a little while, when the aforementioned David Hings returned from one of his uh, find a new exotic uh, uh, friendship trip to Europe. Uh, he'd been cycling through Germany. And he'd come back uh, enamored with German Riesling. And so I, uh, I bought a few bottles and I had some of yours. And I haven't drunk, uh, drunk some Riesling in Germany. Uh, what's the big difference? What sets apart South African Riesling? What, what makes our Riesling a, a little special, if there is something in particular? Well, I, I mean, I, I think South Africa, what, what's amazing about South Africa is we've got all these incredible uh, microclimates all over the place. Uh, and... And, and Riesling is one of those varieties that adapts to its environment um, and really shows sense of place. Uh, so what's amazing is when you drink a, a Riesling from Elgin versus you're drinking a Riesling from Stellenbosch, you can, you can taste the difference. I think one of the great Riesling producers from Stellenbosch Valley is this Jordan Winery. They, they produce a Riesling called the Real McCoy, uh, which is actually a play on the fact that they could, was able to, to name name it Riesling, but there's Hartenberg as well that produces a fantastic Riesling. Uh, and, and, and what's great about Riesling is it's, it's acidity. So it's, it, it, that's freshness that picks up and, and just makes that wine incredible to drink. Um, so if you're tired of Sauvignon Blanc, it's a great alternative. I think it's one of those amazing wines. And as Skolk Stolperberg has just said, it's an amazing wine to pay with curry dishes. It's just absolutely incredible. Yeah, and I was uh, about to pick up on that point there. You've got both the, the sweetness and the acid that come together so well. It's a beautifully composed style of wine, and it does scream out uh, for the right kind of food. Um, and I, I like this one in particular. And I also like the fact that this is just a little bit older. We're drinking a 2017, uh, and uh, it's uh, that little bit of bottle age, I think, just, just adding a, a slightly more to the dimension of the wine. No, without a doubt. Um, uh... So if, I, I would like, because of that sh that higher uh, uh, sugar or RS, so residual sugar in the wine and the acidity, its ability to age is absolutely incredible. Uh, and what, what you can get is, is that, um, uh, um, ironically, if you taste that wine, it's about uh, 18 grams of sugar, but the acidity just comes through and cuts through it. So it actually tastes like a dry, crisp wine, which is absolutely incredible. Mm. No, it's uh, where we talk endlessly about a sense of balance in wine on this show, and there's a, a wonderful balance to this. And I'm uh, already in my head working through my Mr. Delivery orders uh, to see exactly which Indian restaurant I'm off to tonight uh, to uh, to play around with this particular Riesling. Um, do, you, do you know another dish that's absolutely amazing? This is actually sushi. So we have the oh. fish and, and the, 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 the the sometimes the oiliness of a salmon or a tuna. Uh, so the acidity cuts through that, but the the wasabi combination, uh, um, and if, if you can, can imagine wasabi, ginger, and oiliness of the fish with a mm. great riesling is absolutely amazing. 
Right, so I'm now ordering dinner from an Indian restaurant and a Japanese restaurant tonight. Once we get through the Pinot Noir, I've got about eight dishes to look forward to. Uh, before we jump onto that Pinot Noir, quick question from uh, Andrea Rivera. When is the next Riesling Noble Late Harvest Vintage available, asks Andrea. <laughs> yeah, that's so weather dependent. I mean, uh, uh, so the last one we released was 2017, and it looks like... 2020, we've got uh, a Noble Eight Harvest Riesling, which hopefully will be bottling in November this year. All right. Put that one in the diary, and uh, we'll put Paul's mobile phone number up on screen shortly, so you can call him every week to see exactly when it is arriving. A uh, number of queries leading into the Pinot Noir, which is our second one on the back of this quite delightful Riesling. It is uh, an enormously Moorish wine. Uh, Keith McGurley pointing to the specials you've run this week, the Paul Kluver Pinot Noir Steel at 855 Rand for six. Unfortunately, I think that special is over. By the time I tried to get onto it, it was long gone. Uh, Peter Ferreira, Mr. <clears throat> Bubbles, talking about Riesling, needs a little more time to show true character as the ability to age. Well, we've seen that brilliantly with this 2017, which is, uh, I've actually still got another case of this Riesling, so I'll leave it a little bit longer. Uh, and then a question from Tim C, watching on YouTube at the moment. These wines are some of our favorites. We serve the Paul Kluver Pinot and Chardonnay at our wedding. I've got some seven flags here for a special occasion. When should I have the 2016? I think I can answer that partly, Tim, which is where you should have it, and that would be in the Dan Really Likes Wine Cellar with me. In terms of when, though, Paul, uh, when should Tim be opening up this wine? Oh, so uh, um, I'm I'm happy to say that that the, the Seven Flags is really a wine that can age incredibly well. Um, so it it, it dep <laughs> how long are you willing to wait <laughs> is 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 really the question. But it, that wine can easily age for another twenty years. Um, when will it peak? Um, probably in the next ten years. Without it, yeah, I would say next ten years. But can you wait that long? Um, no, I couldn't. I suppose it depends just how much you have. If you've got 10 cases sitting at home, Tim, <laughs> uh, then uh, uh, then you're absolutely fine. You could, of course, invest in a Coravan and have a quarter of an inch every year for the next decade and uh, have it sparingly, but I'm not sure I know any wine drinker who could do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm actually out of that seven flags i need to send you a quiet email once we're done mr cleaver the last time i went <laughs> during lockdown uh, uh pinot noir is important this week not just because you make an excellent version there of all three excellent versions there of your uh, your estate your village and then the aforementioned seven flags but because this is international pinot noir day which I'm sure had you dancing enthusiastically around your front garden, downing Pinot out the bottle and, and celebrating wildly. Uh, is this just a, a, a frivolous recognition of a different grape on a particular day, or is there a little more meaning to International Pinot Noir Day? But it's a good question. I, I, there's actually, and, and um, I spoke to Bruce Whitfield about that this week, and he said, I, I never knew there was an International Pinot Noir Day, but there's um, there's an International Chardonnay Day, there's an International Pinot Noir Day, there's an International Sparkling Wine. Um, so you you mentioned Bubbles for Era. Uh, there's definitely a, a day for, for Bubbles. Um, and it's a celebration, I think, of some of the greatest wine varieties in the world. And without a doubt, um, I can think of few red wine varieties that needs the recognition like Pinot Noir does. It's it's truly one of the most mind blowing varieties in the world. Um, uh, why not celebrate it? It's <laughs> I think you should celebrate it every day, shouldn't you? <laughs> well, that, that was a, slight, a slightly loaded question uh, because I know we were talking earlier on today and we chatted briefly via Instagram on Tuesday about International Pinot Noir Day 2021. There's going to be a big celebration down at Paul Kluver. Uh, David Higgs will be down uh, assisting whoever your celebrity chef is, and we will be looking to have a, a, a great day out, opening some wine and, uh, and bringing the world together for a taste of Pinot Noir. In, indeed. So, uh, you know, David, if, if you haven't seen it and on Instagram, he's made the most incredible take on Buff Bourguignon, which is beef burgundy. 
but instead of using beef, he's he's used uh, lamb knuckles, and it's absolutely insane. I, I'm actually cooking it for a second time this weekend. Um, it's it's uh, it's a South African take. I mean, uh, even Martin mentioned some lamb choppies that he's doing, but we we taking some lamb and the combination of lamb with pinot noir is absolutely amazing. So I, I'm so excited about what, what what David did over there, and and we agreed that next year we're going to do something awesome on the farm together. Pre, pre before that though, we're going to do some mountain biking, and apparently you're bringing your mountain bike down, um, and hopefully you won't crash within the first 50 meters like you did the other day. <laughs> uh, yes. Is there anybody David Higgs hasn't told that particular story to? Uh, how to fall off a bicycle by Dan Nicol. Well, I'm hoping that he'll still post it on YouTube within the next week. Um, <laughs> because apparently you <laughs> fell off your bike in the driveway, right? Uh, it wasn't even the driveway. I was still in the car park. Uh, it was really <laughs> that humiliating. And yes, it will be on the internet later this week. In fact, it was on it was on television across Africa last night. So uh, everyone's had a, a good laugh at my expense, but uh, but happily so. And I will definitely bring my mountain bike down and I will put it in your cellar and I will then take it back home with me, having not ridden it, but drunk plenty of your wine over the course <laughs> of the celebrations. <laughs> let's uh, let's try some of this Pinot Noir because we have got it here. Uh, you've got uh, you've got three options. There's the estate we're drinking now. Uh, you've got the village, which, uh, it, depending on your interpretation, a village in France is a uh, a, a designation which uh, which means pretty good wine. A village can sometimes have a slightly more negative connotation uh, in the English uh, appreciation. Uh, but I think if we even even when we start at what would I suppose be entry level, uh, you've got a really strong Pinot Noir just at ground level with the village onto this estate, and then that seven flags, which is just proper aristocracy. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Um, I, I must admit, so we've been working closely with um, Martin Prier from Domain Jacques Prier in Burgundy. And when we first brought out the village Pinot Noir, he was like, you cannot call it that. Um, and, and partly because of the fact that, that the Burgundians, um, so their entry level wine is actually not village, it's uh, Cote de Bone or Cote de Nuit. Uh, and then after that, it's uh, it's the wine named after the specific village. And, and after the village, it goes specific vineyard um uh, and then it's the the classification of the vineyard so either the vineyard's premier crew or grand crew um but uh it's it's been amazing uh, so what we tend to do with the village pinot noir is the the younger vineyards while they still show this amazing youthfulness and and the purity of fruit uh, once the vineyards hit about 10 years of age um showing some um, maturity and complexity we we those grapes go into the state pinot noir uh, and really, once only once they really have some wisdom and age, uh, they go into seven flags. Um, so seven flags, on average, the vineyards are over 25 years old, uh, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and what we're drinking tonight, uh, as you said, is the uh, state Pinot Noir. It, it, it just got the award of the best Pinot Noir in South Africa and the top 100 wines of South Africa. Um, so that, well, that was absolutely amazing. Um, and what I love about the wine is just this incredible elegance and balance. Um, I, I would say it's, this, is, this is the wine for wine lovers, um, people who, who just want to be taken on a romance. As I mentioned on Monday night when we were a little further north of you and chatting to Peter Finlayson and to Anthony Hamilton Russell about their Hemelonada Pinot Noir, I married a beautiful Greek lawyer who absolutely will not drink Pinot Noir, uh, which was uh, both a, a, a terrible error, uh, but also great in that I get the entire bottle uh, as and when I need it. Uh, but she likes something that's, that's big and strong and bold, and that's absolutely fine. People have different palates. Uh, what I love about a great Pinot Noir, and this is certainly another example, is that it's got that softness, it's got that elegance, but it doesn't mean it lacks character. It doesn't mean that it sits quietly in the corner and doesn't say much. Uh, it actually just delivers uh, a really good, strong mouthful of wine, despite being so refined and elegant. Um, and even when it's... Uh... Mm. But but I, I, I think your, your, your comment there, Dan, is absolutely spot on. Uh, I think too often 
we we live in an environment where we want instant gratification. It's about um, absolutely, and we often think that more is more. So, and 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 if you think about it, it it's it, for for me, it's like when you say if you're having a great pizza, a little bit of pepper and salt on it is amazing, right? So why don't I just put more pepper and salt on it? Um, it doesn't actually end up with a better product. Uh, and and f- Pinot Noir is all about nuances, elegance, and balance. And, and, and for that, you actually need to time out. You need to move away from your busy, crazy life. You need to move away from the stressful environment and lockdown that you are about. And you actually need to sit down and say, what is this wine about? And, 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 and one of the great things a Frenchman once told me is, is uh, a great Pinot Noir is the type of wine that you want to take out on a second date. So this girl, and, and it's it's as you're sitting there, smelling, enjoying this wine, you go, actually, I love this. When can I do this again? This is incredible. Um, and for me, that's what what you really want. It's it's not about this just like wow, because I think often you're disappointed with the end result. You are so impressed with the initial impression that um, you you. It, it fails to deliver at the end of the day, and that's not what you want. Um, and and Pinot Noir for me has that incredible uh, subtlety and beauty to it. And this is a reminder of exactly those two qualities. Uh, Paul, we're uh, we're drifting towards the end, sadly, and I know you've uh, you've probably got some old episodes of Frasier to go and watch, and I've got some more wine to to get through before I join Mr. David Higgs live on Instagram at eight thirty as we talk through our highlights of lockdown, food and wine wise, indulging ourselves in the, in challenging times. I see Scott Stapelberg saying he's in Hermanus next week, and we'll be making a stop. Fill your boot up. Uh, use the uh, there's a very special code ask Paul Kluver uh, and use the code Dan said you can get a really good discount and you'll get looked after uh, incredibly well uh, just before we do let you head off Paul uh, exciting developments uh, on the Paul Kluver horizon what have we got to to look forward to oh, well firstly I should say apparently David said because he's opening up marble on the 1st of September and he said that you would be pouring some wine in his restaurant, um, uh, playing a sommelier role. So I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not going to be there for that, but so well done that you are actually willing to help up the restaurant industry during this time of struggle. So uh, well well done on that. Uh, on, 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 on Paul Kluver, uh, I, for me, you, you're talking about cycling. Uh, the, the amazing thing is Wines to Wales is actually doing a reverse, and we stay cycling from... Hermanus through the through the farm. So instead of from Somerset West to Hermanus, they're doing Hermanus to Somerset West for the first time in the 11 years of the Wines to Wells, which I think is going to be amazing. Uh, and and uh, I'm uh, we, we will be reopening the restaurant again in November. It's been closed during this whole time um, of, of lockdown, but um, we're excited for that. And rightly so. It's a terrific restaurant. The food is fabulous, but uh, for me, it's still the wine that is the starring, starring role. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for uh, for dropping in and uh, and for giving us the time. It's a, a busy week for one of the premier Pinot Noir producers on the planet. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining uh, joining us and, and not just giving us the Pinot Noir, but also the Riesling. I, I really do believe it's a grape. We should get a bit more time to give a bit more uh, bit more enjoyment to. And uh, if you get a chance, find a bottle, open a bottle. I think you might be pleasantly pleasantly surprised but uh, uh paul Cleaver, thank you so much keep making wonderful wine keep giving us great places to ride bikes and we look forward to having you back on the show again soon thanks dan take care and we'll see you next year Indeed. We'll be right, down yeah. at Paul Kluver for International Pinot Noir Day. Put that in the diary. I will be down there. David Higgs will be down there. Uh, Niles Crane from Frasier will be there. And we'll be having a splendid time, enjoying terrific wine, some wonderful food, and whatever else Paul conjures up with his Kluver team. So that is us on Dan Really Likes Wine for this evening. There is still some entertainment later on. As I say, you can join uh, either my Instagram feed or David Higgs is at about 8.30. We'll be looking back at some of our food and wine highlights 
from the last five months. It's been a really tough time, and we're not trying to make light of that, but it has been time where we've stayed at home. David has rediscovered his love of food and cooking. I've discovered so much wine through that time, and we're going to have some fun looking back on those last few months. With wine now, open your chance to buy more wine, to look after the industry, to support everybody in that industry. And remember, if you're not already, join the Pick and Pay Wine Club. Membership is free. You get three times the smart shopper points. And every month, 10 different wines at a 20% discount, giving a really nice selection of some great, great South African offerings. Uh, looking ahead to next week, we've got some more great wine makes, including towards the back end of next week, I think Thursday next week, we're off to the Bunhook Valley for a very special Cabernet Sauvignon session. And one or two surprise guests for Monday as well in what should be another busy week and also on the horizon looking at some cool stuff around national heritage day national bride day that's the back end of september uh looking at something with some syrah and the guys at Antony Rupert. And we'll also be looking ahead through the month to the Shannon Blanc Awards of Standard Bank and see who the top 10 are there. But for today, a huge thank you to Paul Cleaver. He's always great entertainment and making some terrific wine, those Rieslings and Pinot Noirs in particular. And to Martin Lamprecht, one of the most entertaining people in wine, straight off the cuff, always honest, making inexpensive wine of the highest quality and having a lot of fun doing so. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Dan really likes wine with Pick and Pay. I'm Dan Nickel. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.